Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It is 12 o'clock, Friday, September 4th. And I'm going to welcome everybody to a, another presentation of the meeting uh, for Lee County Bar Association. Uh, very proud to be joined today uh, as we talk about e-filing uh, and filing documents and all the changes going on with our uh, COVID adjustments and uh, working remotely. Very, very happy to be joined by our clerk of uh, the Lee County Court System, Ms. Linda Doggett, along with some of her staff today, Mr. Kevin Carnes and Ms. Sheila Jerome. Uh, Linda is, is kind enough to take some time out of her day with her, her staff to go ahead and, and join us and walk us through kind of some of the changes and, and updates, which I know affect us all who have filings down at the courthouse uh, or document review uh, or initiating new cases. Uh, so we're very grateful they, they have been able to come on and take the time to be with us today with this. Uh, by way, a, a little bit of introduction about Linda for, for those, uh, I don't know how you don't know her if you don't know her by now, if you practice here in, in Lee County. Um, but just for a, a little introduction, uh, Linda took office. She was, she was sworn in uh, as a clerk in January 2013. She was again reelected as our clerk of court in 2016 for a four year term. And I know we're all very happy uh, that she has been, uh, well, she ran unopposed. Uh, I don't know who would have opposed her. That's <laughs> a great of a job she's doing. Uh, ran unopposed in, in 2020 is going to be with us for another four years, which we're, we're very, very happy about. Uh, Linda has a bachelor's degree in management information systems. Uh, she's held just about every office you can, you can imagine at the clerk's office from being chief operating officer, the IT director, course department director. Uh, she oversees the staff, which is incredible, uh, oversees a staff of 340 employees. Uh, and serves all of Lee County, which is quickly approaching uh, 750,000 residents. So her, her job is, uh, is an important one and her time is, is extremely valuable. So without uh, further ado, Linda has a, a great presentation for us with Kevin and Sheila. So I'm gonna turn it over to Linda so they can walk us through the presentation and deliver a bunch of great information for us today. Uh, if you have questions, I know that Kevin uh, when he's doing his presentation, Kevin is happy to take questions as he as he goes along. Uh, if you want to send them in the chat or uh, notify us through um, the Zoom software, uh, but we invite you to sit back and enjoy the information, take notes. This is being recorded and will be posted on our Lee County Bar YouTube page, uh, YouTube channel, if you'd like to watch at a later date. So thank you all for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Linda. Great. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Lauren, um, for this great and the, and the Bar Association for this great generous opportunity, really, to share some really great information about these um, these new things that are happening. Uh, some of these things get pushed, got pushed a little bit harder, I think, because of the COVID-19 um, and the all of the all of the courts uh, activities moving remotely or at least most of them. Um, so we really had to come together and really work on, on how we can better support um, our customers and the court system with more remote um, services and more efficient remote services, really. So when we volunteered for this presentation, uh, we were very excited to talk about um, how the clerk and the court came together to offer this uh, ability to e-file proposed orders directly to the assigned judge using the e-filing portal. And as we started to put together our presentation, um, we had discovered that the e-filing authority had a new update coming for the e-filing portal that I believe it's coming out in two weeks, somewhere in that time frame. Um, and the update allows for other documents, not just proposed orders, um, to be routed to the presiding judge and bypassing the clerk. And again, this is a great efficient way of, you know, of doing these things remotely. So um, our presentation is now entitled, as you can see on your screen, Documents for Judicial Review. And that's, again, because you can do more than just um, proposed orders. Um, so I'm going to introduce Kevin Carnes and Sheila Jerome, who many of you already know. Um, to go through the presentation. Now, I'll talk a little bit about Kevin. Kevin does work for me. He's been part of the court team in the clerk's office for almost 13 years. 
And for the past two years, we have been very fortunate uh, to have him as our chief um, uh, officer of courts. Kevin holds a master's degree in legal studies. He leads 171 professional and caring, I like to call them, team members who are responsible for everything court related in the clerk's office. That includes things like customer service, the call center, the self-help center, collections for all court fees and fines in Lee County, all the financial accounting and reporting related to that. Uh, all the court records, all the case intake, all the processing, all of the documents that come through our system. Um, and of course, um, uh, uh, the court clerk team, you can't forget them. And, uh, and of course, he's got a team of technical and business operational support people because the system can be pretty complicated as, as uh, you might know. So Kevin has accomplished really so much during his tenure with the clerk's office. We've made a lot of changes. He's been an essential part of really many major changes, including um, our implementation of e-filing, electronic citations for us, electronic bookings. He leads several uh, circuit-wide collaboration efforts to standardize processes and affect positive change. Kevin really is an essential part of our vision. And we started this vision statement a few years ago and it really, I think, embodies Kevin and his team to be recognized as a premier model of exceptional government by our customers and our community. So um, we're very, very fortunate to have Kevin. And, and I also wanna give an introduction to Sheila. Sheila Jerome is the civil and family division director she doesn't work for me. She works for the administrative office of the courts, but she's a great partner. So we, we're we just, you know, partners in crime all the way around. Sheila is really here for questions. Uh, Kevin is going to do go through most of the presentation and Sheila has some additional information that she'll provide. She'll answer questions um, to, that are directed towards how the court needs things done as she's working with the circuit civil and family judges on procedural changes as we transition to the e-filing of these documents for judicial review. So having said that, Kevin, would you get us started? I will. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, and I want to thank you, Matt and, and Lauren, for allowing Sheila and I to come in and, and give this presentation uh, today. Uh, I think this is the next big step for, for the court system. And I'm really excited about what we have to share uh, with you all. I can see that we have some members of the judiciary and AOC, and uh, we have a, a good representation of the entire system here, so I'm excited. Um, I'm really, as Matt said before, I'm very flexible with questions. Uh, this is all new to all of us, so please feel free to ask your questions as I go along or submit things to the chat. Uh, this is a, uh, I don't want to say a complex process because it really follows the same kind of workflow that you all submit. Uh, your documents to the clerk's office, it just gives you additional pathway to submit your document to the court. So please ask your questions as we go. If I don't know something, I may pause to give Sheila or Linda a chance to, to answer if we know. Uh, if we don't, we will follow back up with you all to get the, the answers that you need to make this process as comfortable uh, and easy as possible. So without further ado, uh, Linda already gave an introduction on why this is called uh, Documents for Judicial Review. Um, that is a new title. Uh, it's currently available in the e-portal today known as Proposed Orders. Uh, so that is a change for me because I've been calling it Proposed Orders for about uh, a year and a half or so. So if I call it Proposed Orders instead of Documents for Judicial Review, those two terms are, are synonymous. So uh, bear with me. Um, See if I can get this to work. There we go. So the judicial filing review path is, is in a sense, like I said before, almost the exact same process uh, for you all um, as you submit your documents to the clerk's office through the, the e-filing portal, but it will go to the assigned judge of your case instead of, of the clerk's office. Um, so it's a collaborative effort between the clerk and AOC to ensure that the codes that we pick in the system makes sense for what you're trying to file. Um, and we work collaboratively on the integration of that to make sure that everything uh, matches up and is, gives clarity to the docket, 
Um, so when a judge or the clerk is looking at the image, it actually makes sense and they don't have to do a whole bunch of review and reading. So the big part about judicial filing, uh, the judicial review queue, is that if it's a proposed order of sorts and it goes to the court for signature, those documents will eventually workflow back to the clerk's office um, to be docketed in our system into the actual court record. Um, there are some documents that may just go to the judge and will not come back to the clerk's office. That is brand new functionality of that system release that Linda was telling you about. We don't have all the details yet about that. Uh, today's focus is really on documents that will go to the, to the judge and, and then subsequently back to the clerk. Um, Sheila and I will continue to work on things that will go just to the judge uh, and not have a clerk involvement. So I'm sure in the future we may have another one of these sessions that we come back to you all uh, and give you more information on that. Um, so how does this work? Uh, I've said it a couple of times where you just follow the single session filing path of the ePortal. Um, so you're really just picking a different radio button on the front page of the e-filing portal. Um, and I'll, I'll show you all what that looks like and we'll go through this process with some screen prints so you have a little bit of familiarity uh, with the process. There are a few things different about this workflow path that I wanted to make sure that uh, you all know about. Uh, that cover letter, uh, there is a section of this workflow path that makes you submit a covered letter. Um, to the judge so they can actually see why you're requesting the document along with the document you want them to look at. Uh, and that's something that each judge gets to determine whether they want to see or not. Um, we are see, we're, we're seeing that be a judicial preference. Uh, I think most judges are, are leaning towards not having the cover letter, uh, but there may be some divisions and some case types where a cover letter is, is, is appropriate. Hey, Kevin, if I could interrupt you for a second. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering, are you able to change your slides so we can follow along? I'm not sure, they're not changing them from our perspective. Oh, they're not changing at all? Uh, how about, <laughs> I was on the second tab. What about now? Uh, now we're seeing your desktop. <laughs> all right, give me Sorry. a Sorry, nope, I didn't mean to mess you out there. Technical um, difficulties. What can you see? I guess what we should have probably figured this out. What can you see, Linda? Well, I think we're seeing your desktop now. All right. So. What about now? Still seeing your desktop. What in the heck? Maybe we can um, get Lauren to steal you back. Oh, there you go. Yes, can you see it now? Yes. All right, so if I go here. There you go, that's working, okay. thank you. I apologize, thank you for letting me know, Linda. <laughs> uh, so this is where the slide was at. Uh, yeah. I apologize about the cover letter. Um, I apologize. Um, so we're on the third bullet here. Uh, another big change about this process for j documents that require judicial review is that the filer becomes responsible for the certificate of service process. I'm not gonna get into that too much here because we have a lot of slides uh, dedicated to that topic. Um, there is a piece of the puzzle where the clerk's office will continue to help with the certificate of service process. Things that are really complicated, things that go to a lot of parties or things that require uh, certified copies. Um, the clerk will still help here. Uh, this is a collaborative project, uh, I think between the attorneys um, agencies, uh, AOC and the clerk, uh, and we'll all be working together to make sure that people get their documents in the right way in the right time. Um, and of course, the signed orders are sent to, to the judge and uh, back to the clerk's office. So here is a general flow um, of how the certificate of service process will work with the, in the new way of doing business using this workflow chart. Um, you'll have all this. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but what I wanted to show you all with this slide is that the importance of those green boxes on your screen. And what that's basically saying is that whoever is submitting the document to the court electronically for signature is ultimately responsible for the certificate of service. And as you all know, that certificate of service is who's getting the document uh, either before signature or after signature. 
so anything through this workflow path, meaning through the ePortal to the assigned judge, is the responsibility of the filer. Uh, I think in many circumstances, that will be you all as attorneys, uh, but it could also be uh, agencies uh, that need to file documents like state probation and other kind of agencies and entities like that. So this workflow chart basically just shows you how the document flows from one entity to the next uh, and how it workflows into the numerous systems that the clerks and the courts navigate in order to do um, our business. So here, the next couple of slides here are just kind of a, a visual representation about how you submit your document uh, to your court. I'm going to go over these pretty quickly because I think most of you are probably familiar with this process today. Um, but I, I felt it necessary to go over uh, just in a high level. So this is the main page that you all see when you submit your documents. You're probably used to picking uh, that second radio bullet uh, that says feeding on an existing case. Um, the new workflow path, as you can see, is that very bottom one where it says documents for judicial review. So nothing will change in, in your process about submitting documents to the clerk's office. You'll still submit that feeding to existing case. Uh, if you're wanting it to go to the judge for signature or for review, you would pick that new one and you would pick your county just like you did before. So the second slide is pretty much the same. You'd pick your, your division, you'd put in your, your case number information and choose your court type. Uh, what is different is that you have a new uh, option down there that's highlighted that says judicial officer or division. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Judge McHugh, Chief Judge McHugh is in that workflow uh, chart. Those judicial uh, drop-down menus are controlled by the court type. So all judges within the same court type will be in that drop-down uh, list. And we'll go over who is, is, is currently using the workflow path uh, in a later slide. So after you pick your judge, uh, you are going to pick your document, just like you normally do. Um, and you have the available codes uh, available to you. Um, what's different, again, is that little box that's highlighted where the, the courts would like to know whether the, the order is opposed or unopposed. Um, and it will make you choose that radio button option. So if you don't do it, it will remind you to click one of those boxes. And then, of course, you get to the service list. And I think this is where um, I want to spend a lot of time in the presentation because it's such a change for all of us and it's so impactful. Uh, because of that workflow chart that I showed you before. Uh, if someone is not added to the certificate of service list up front, meaning through this business process of you submitting your document to the court, uh, they're not going to get the signed version. Uh, so this complete e-service step of this process is extremely important uh, to everyone. So the portal has a lot of functionality. Uh, it's getting more after the September uh, release. But I, I really encourage everyone to make sure that they take some step and some times to make sure that the service list is accurate and complete when they're doing this process. And so there's three little tabs there in the middle about e-service. The electronic service one, that first tab, is anybody that's going to be already on the service list or a default service list. Uh, and those last two tabs there are the, the filer's way of adding new um, parties to the service list. So those two things are really important for you if you need to add someone that's not part of the default. Um, I'll, I'll pause in just a second to take questions, but that last piece after you figure out the service list uh, is just your double check method to make sure that you've hit all of your, uh, your steps in the process that exists today in the ePortal where it gives you one last moment to make sure that everything is complete. And then, of course, it goes on its way to the destination uh, that you picked. Um, so before we go on, does anybody have any questions um, about what they just saw or heard? Diana, I think you're muted. No? Okay. Remember to unmute yourself if you have a question, because I don't think I have the ability to do that as, as host. So, um, so after that workflow uh, process uh, happens and it goes to, to the court uh, for signature, you have the ability to, to actually see the audit trail. Uh, this is a new piece of the puzzle in regards to the, to the e-portal after September 12th. 
there is a button along the top of the screen that says view notice of electronic filing. Uh, that is where you'll be able to uh, actually see who was serviced the actual document. So once you get that filing submission number, you can use this to see who got the document and who did not. Uh, I think this is a really uh, beneficial tool for attorneys. Uh, I think it's extremely critical for the courts because they can actually see who got the document uh, and when. Um, and so that, that's a really good tool that's being added uh, after September that you all can actually see the process. Uh, a little bit more uh, in detail. Um, so what the, as we get through the, this, this new project of submitting documents to the court, a lot more attorneys and agencies are gonna be added to the service list. Uh, so we anticipate some of you all saying, I don't need this document anymore, I don't represent this client anymore, or this is no longer in my, in my realm. Uh, so there is some, some flexibility to have you uh, remove yourself from the service list uh, in the ePortal. Um, but it's important to remember that whoever added you to the service list ultimately controls whether you get removed. Uh, so if you are the, the initiator of, of a document or a case, uh, it's on your cases, it's my cases page where you really control um, the service list at that point. If another attorney or an agency added you to the service list, they are the ultimate authority on how you get. Uh, removed. You still have a little flexibility in how to do that in the ePortal, uh, but it basically is a request process to that attorney to say, hey, will you please remove me from the service list so I don't get um, notifications anymore. Um, because what that what proposed orders will do is it, it ultimately sends one document, the actual proposed image, to everybody on the service list up front. So when you hit submit and it assigns the submission number, uh, everybody that you added to the service list will get the unsigned proposed document that you submitted for the court. The judge uh, has the ability to review the, that document. They can de deny it, they can sign it, uh, and based upon that action, it creates another workflow back to those e, uh, the, the certificate of service list. So if they sign it, those same parties now get the signed version of that order. Um, if they don't sign it, they'll, they'll basically say that your, your order wasn't approved and you don't get the, the it doesn't get filed into to the court file. Um, so it's important to remember that your, your document as the, as the order needs to be in a Word format. Um, that's different than the e-filing path. Uh, the reason why that is different is because the courts have the ability to modify their order um, when they're reviewing it. Um, so it is a little bit of a frame in, in process. When you're submitting to the clerk, it'll be in PDF. When you're submitting it to the, to the courts, it'll be in Word format. So any more questions? Anybody have any, any concerns or ideas? All right, I don't have too many more slides left. So the $64,000 question is, is who is currently uh, using this process and how, what are next steps? Um, so today, uh, the, the county court judges have been a, a phenomenal partnership in, in, this, in this endeavor, uh, and anything county court related uh, is currently able to be e-filed uh, through, through this new path. Um, so small claims, county civil, misdemeanor, criminal traffic, um, that is completely alive and available to you all uh, today, and you can start doing that um, immediately following this call. Uh, the same thing exists for uh, the circuit civil judges. Um, that is specific to circuit civil case types that are non-foreclosure. So that's a very small window uh, today, uh, but it is there and, and, and is working and it has been positive change on the court system. So what we're working towards is the plan on how every, all the other judges and all the other case types uh, will, will come together. Uh, and we really thought it was it's best to wait until after the September release. Uh, the September 12th weekend date is a big day for the ePortal to kind of come back with this new thing. So really, between the months of September and October, you'll see a big uh, shift in what judges are in the drop-down list and what case types are available uh, to you all. So September, we, we hope to have circuit criminal, which is felony, the rest of the circuit civil case types for probate, guardianship, and mental health. Uh, juvenile for delinquency and dependency, uh, family, and of course, civil magistrates and hearing officers 
uh, hopefully are in the scope of September. Uh, there were two kind of pieces of the puzzle that we felt was appropriate to move to October based upon the complexity of the court types. So you'll likely see foreclosure documents and CSE documents kind of taking a back seat until October until we can get those processes uh, in place. Um, that's really because case management in the Department of Revenue is really integrated into those two specific case types and we want to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, by going in this. Uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, Sheila wanted me to reiterate this, that these are target dates for us. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces with this. We're trying to get all the judges trained on it. Uh, so we hope to be live within this time frame, uh, but we may have a, a more fluid schedule if we hit any snags. Um, I think the circuit criminal and civil are, are pretty much a, a given to go in September. Uh, I think the juvenile and family are a little bit more fluid and hopefully will be live in September, but likely towards the end. Uh, and then the civil magistrates and hearing officers will also probably be uh, in September. Uh, Sheila, I'll pause there. Did I get that right? Yeah, you're muted, but I'll take that as a... There, I was trying to unmute. I was hitting the wrong button. I apologize. No, that's accurate. Um, definitely civil. I don't think there'll be an issue at all with that. And family's looking really good at this point. So, and dependency. Perfect. Um, I appreciate the confirmation, Sheila. I just wanted to... So the advantages and disadvantages of, of this, I, I think are, are pretty clear, but uh, the advantages are no more paper. Uh, that is a huge shift for all of us and it makes things a lot easier uh, because it brings consistency and continuity in how we do business in the courthouse. Uh, the second one, trackable filing IDs. Uh, you'll now, now be able to see where your order is at in the process. Uh, today with paper, you kind of drop it off and you don't really know uh, when it's going to get signed or when it's going to be filed with the clerk's office. So this move allows you to see the judge hasn't seen it yet or it hasn't been signed yet. Um, so that's a really important step. Quicker turnaround, I think anything digital or paperless uh, ultimately means that it will be quicker. Uh, I think specifically in regards to the certificate of service, you'll get it immediately upon judge signature. Uh, today, it's not as quick because we're either mailing things out via U.S. mail or the clerk's office has to, to send that out in a separate process. So hopefully you get service of your court orders a little bit uh, quicker. Uh, that last advantage there is that you all as the filer control this process. You're controlling what the document is, you're controlling who gets it, uh, and you're controlling pretty much the entire process today. So it gives you a little bit more autonomy in how you uh, conduct your process uh, serving your clients and, and getting things through uh, the system. There are a few uh, disadvantages to this process that I think we're all going to rely on each other to make sure the gaps are addressed. Uh, we do have a work group built in the court system to kind of talk about these challenges and concerns uh, because I do think they are valid, um, but we got to go through them in order to fix them, I guess is my, my, my standpoint. So the disadvantages are that some parties are going to be left off the service list. Uh, a big challenge right now is, is how, do, how do we all as filers know which email addresses to add at the time we're submitting the document? Uh, so there are gonna be some parties that are left off the service list and we just need to be hypersensitive to, to how to fix that uh, going into the next couple of months. Uh, the second uh, disadvantage is that, that there are two different versions of the document sent to that e-service list. It is another email in your inbox, and I'm sure we all get a million emails a day. Uh, so that two versions is something that we can't really change because it's controlled at the statewide level. Um, but I think over communication is better when it comes to the court system. So hopefully it's not too terribly uh, cumbersome. Uh, that last one is the email maintenance uh, and the email address. So as users leave and come and go and people change their email address, uh, it becomes really important to be aware of what email addresses do in this new world. Um, it's difficult to get email address for, for respondents and, and things of that nature. So there's a, a new shift is, is from the clerk's office at least about how do we get that email information up front so when you are submitting your, your documents or the judge is signing it, that it's going out electronically and you don't have this kind of split process of paper and electronic. There are a lot of materials out there for you all. Um, the the ePortal has a bunch of FAQs and user guides that are available to you. They have YouTube channels. 
um, manuals. I mean, you name it, uh, it's out there for you all uh, to go and, and, and look at how this process works. And that's the top part of this slide. Um, but I also want to make my team available to you all to ask any questions or concerns about this new process. Uh, so I have two sets of information there. Uh, that top half is, is my group of, of, of team members that are responsible for making sure that you, that you get answers. Um, so that top one is an email box that you can utilize to ask questions and kind of get familiar with. Uh, and that phone number there is a, a phone line that we operate in the call center specifically for attorneys. Uh, so feel free to utilize that to get uh, some one-on-one -on -one time uh, with a customer service agent. Uh, if it's something a little bit more complex and something that you need some help on, I am more than willing to help uh, as an escalation point. Uh, and you have my phone number and email address uh, there, and I will be more than happy to help you through uh, that process. So I'll pause here for questions uh, with a, a reminder to please keep your Florida Bar profile uh, up to date. Uh, we get a daily file from the Florida Bar, and we rely on that heavily to make sure that you're added to the service list uh, programmatically. Um, with that, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I'll take any questions uh, that you have. So Sheila, did you have additional information about some of the um, maybe specific things that some of the judges will be requiring that you would like to discuss? I, I can't. <laughs> I hate this program. Um, just, they're basically general um, items. Some of the family law judges really are um, expecting or want you all to understand that when it goes live for the e-filing, that is their preference. They'd rather see that than having um, proposed judgments emailed to them. So um, a couple of the judges, Judge um, Hawthorne and Judge Porter wanted that to be made clear. Um, also is terms of the civil judges, they, um, Judge Lobota wanted to make clear they're doing the process, it's working really well, they'll expand it to those other categories. But she said that they do reserve the right to make some cases where they say they don't want it e-filed, they want you to submit the paper proposed judgments and envelopes and whatnot, and that'll just sort of be um, at the judge's discretion. She doesn't expect it to be frequently, but she wants to leave that option open so that people are aware that that might happen and that might be expected of them. And I think the same is true for family on a case-by-case -case basis. And that was basically the gist. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? I have a question. Okay. Um, so I think you may have addressed this and I could have missed it. If the judge does not approve of the uh, order that's being submitted, did you say that the attorney would get an email notification that it was not approved? I believe so. Uh, that's something that we're testing in the work group uh, because I think in some time, in some instances, the court is filing an order to deny uh, the, the order as well. Um, so I'm testing that right now. Uh, so I'll, ha I'll add that to uh, the PowerPoint presentation and follow up questions, Adele. Um, I believe that is how it's working. So everybody knows uh, that the status of that order, uh, but I'll confirm and get back with you. Thank you. I had a question for you, Sheila. And you were saying that sometimes the judges would not want the orders to be e-filed. So um, how would the attorneys be aware of that requirement? The judges would uh, make it specific to that case. So they're all looking forward to, and I believe with civil, it's still running pretty smoothly where they've been working that process of them being emailed. But once it's e-filed, um, it would definitely just be on a case by case basis. For example, when there are, there might be a case with multiple pro se parties that they may want to have that submitted in paper versus coming through um, with an e-file. But I don't expect that that'd be common, more, more like the exception, but we didn't want to be boxed in. <laughs> Okay. I think we have a chatted question. Yeah, so uh, Matthew Henry asked, excuse me, <clears throat> are proposed orders in work from format for the judicial officer to be able to modify, or are they a non-editable uh, PDF? Uh, great question, uh, Matthew. 
any orders filed directly to the court would be in a word format so they do have the ability to modify the language within it uh, once they submit it to the clerk's office the, the behind the scenes will make it a, a pdf uh, document um, i hope that answered your question to word documents to the to the court Any other questions? Yes, I actually have another one. Okay. Um, so would, for instance, you know, the multiple family law judges, um, will it be posted on the administrative website as to what each judge's preference will be for submission of orders? Well, they'll be posted in multiple places, I think, but um, for the most part right now, we haven't finished training them all. There are two that remain to be um, trained on the process, um, but they're all on board with them being e-filed. And so I think, again, it's like with the civil judges, it'll be by exception. Um, I'm trying to recall at least three of the four that I spoke with so far have said that they want their preferences for them all to be e-filed. Um, and they'll deal with them at that point. Um, and some of them are setting it up in such a way, um, it's obviously this is private and then it's a combination of their JAs working and reviewing things and the judges and then the submission after that point. So, um, and my understanding is, is that the judges, JAs, if for some reason the judge isn't accepting that order, will make it known that it's rejected. I'm not really sure in what fashion, but we'll send it back. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that was a great point, uh, Adele. I think that as we, quote, flip the switch for judges and new court types, uh, we're hoping to make that visible on the clerk's website, on the AOC's uh, website, and hopefully uh, through email blast uh, with Lauren's help. Uh, so you all have multiple points of contact to know that new judges and new case types are going to be in the drop down list. Uh, I think Lauren sends those out on Fridays. So hopefully all the pieces come together to, to make that happen. Okay, thank you. Yes, Kevin, I do send those out in my news. You can use newsletter every Friday, but I can also send out a specialized and isolated email for any updates that you guys may have. Um, so just be sure that you're opening those emails. And if you are not getting my emails, please alert me and I'll add you to our list. Perfect. Well, again, thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, I'll go back to this. I don't know if I can go back a slide. No, nope, doesn't look like it. Uh, you have my contact information on the PowerPoint slide, uh, and Sheila and I will help you uh, through the process. I hope you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, you guys, for speaking. We really appreciate it. Linda, Kevin, and Sheila. As he said, if anyone has any questions, let us know. I'll be happy to facilitate those and get those over to Kevin and get answers responded to everyone. On behalf of the Lee County Bar, thank you for your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you for part two with the newest information. So everyone have a great day and a great long weekend. Thank you, Lauren, and we hope you feel better. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.